Hi, Charles. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, so for the audience, this is the second part of our cybersecurity special. And I'm really looking forward to it because you have, in, at least in our previous conversations, had some very unique things to say about it, especially in the realm of social media. But for those uh, in the audience who don't know you, could you just give a brief introduction about who you are and what led you into the career in cybersecurity? Okay. I'm Charles Phillips. I'm a cybersecurity analyst. I've been in the profession now for about three years. Uh, prior to that, I was in IT. Um, and what led me into security is actually kind of a funny story. Uh, while I was working at a university, I met our cybersecurity guru, uh, great name, great name, name of Carl. Uh, we spoke a lot. He got me interested in kind of, you know, the ins and outs. He showed me some of the really, you know, like, dark secret black magic kind of things that you could do which really piqued my interest it's like well you know if that's what you can actually do with it what else can you do and just kind of spurred me down that path very that's quite cool actually yeah i, I mean i've heard of uh, is it the dark web i think is that the correct term mm -hmm. yeah so i i, I that's I, I know it exists but that's really the the limit of my knowledge on it so yeah there's there's a lot of, of things that i think day to day we we really don't know you know, with this, you know, for lack of a better term, this monster that is the internet, it can be used very well, and it can also be used very badly. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why you're on today, because you're going to tell us how to be safe uh, and to use it more like a tool. But something I want to clear up, and, you know, this this question was asked to me, but w w by definition, what is a hacker? Okay, well, hackers got kind of two different definitions, depending on who you ask. Um, if you talk about some, or you speak with somebody in cybersecurity, a hacker is a person who likes to take things, break things, rearrange them, put them together in new ways to do new things. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a child that likes to take apart the remote and try to figure out how it works, that could potentially be a hacker. Um, I remember reading an article in one of the uh, hacker quarterlies about a guy who was hacking his low flow toilet so that he'd actually get a high flow toilet out of it. <laughs> that could be potentially considered a hacker as well. Then you get on kind of the negative connotation of it, which was mainly spurred on by the news, where a hacker is a thief or a crook or some kind of criminal trying to steal data, steal money, you know, anything that's nefarious or up to no good. So when you when you speak about hackers, it, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's either you're kind of on the camp that um, it's a good thing to have. It's like a good good um, mentality to possess. You, you're curious. You're wondering or you're just a malicious bad guy so that's really interesting because like i'm in the engineering profession myself and i love taking things apart i love understanding why things work and you know how it all meshes together uh obviously i would never use it for you know uh, horrible purposes you know i like the whole point of me being an engineer is i love to build and fix things um but it's interesting then that for me, and this is my own ignorance here, that hacker I always was assumed was a very negative word, and it was something that you know I I did hear in the news, and you know it's the next big company's been hacked, or uh, you know this has happened, and it's like well, we never hear uh, you know anything positive about hackers or this or even I don't want to say maybe positive but a neutral term of hacker. Um, uh, I have started to hear about though. Um, is it? Um, I, I I'm, can't remember the name exactly, but it's essentially hackers who are the good guys. They deliberately try to break into systems to make them stronger. Is is what's that called again? Uh, there's a couple of different terms for it. Um, you could call them a white hat hacker mm -hmm. versus a black hat hacker. Uh, if you go back to the old uh, Wild West movies from like the 50s and 60s, maybe even beyond that. Um, where the good guy always wore a white hat and the bad guy always wore a black hat. Yeah. Um, you can also, uh, the, as a profession that's considered penetration testers, where a individual is hired by a company or organization to hack into their systems and then report on how they did it, how to short up security, how to, you know, fix the problems that they discovered. Yeah. Okay. I, I, actually, I've just remembered the name now. Ethical hacker. That was the word. Oh, I was, yeah. Ethical hacking. I think yeah, is that is that a separate term again, or is that just the umbrella term for that? That's just another term for the same thing. Um, yeah. and, and speaking of ethical hacking, that's really what defines the two between a you know a good guy a good guy hacker versus a bad guy hacker, is ethics. You yeah. know, I I would potentially have the same skill set that a hacker 
trying to break into a system would have to do nefarious things, but it's the ethics that really define the two of us. I would do it and say, this is how I broke in. This is what you need to do to fix things. Whereas the, you know, bad guy hacker would use that for whatever ends that they want to do, be it stealing data, stealing money, yeah, you know, doing damage, whatever they want, whatever they're after. Yeah. So, okay. So these, these, these people exist. Why do they hack? That's an interesting question. There's a lot of different reasons and some of them you wouldn't even think about. Um, so if we're speaking about bad guy hackers uh, solely, they obviously the obvious ones there. There's money, there's fame, there's reputation. There's also curiosity. Um, a lot of hackers will start out trying to break something and then end up falling in with the wrong crowd or getting caught by some organization that then tries to employ them to do not so not so legal things. But you also have other hackers that just do it for the lulls. They just really want to just do it to you know, cause chaos or for their own entertainment. Mm-hmm. You also have hacktivists that do it for a political purpose. Uh, for example, Anonymous is a hacktivist organization where they hack and break things um, to, to pursue their what they consider political ends. Uh, for example, when they decided to go after Scientology, um, they did a lot of different things against that organization that they felt was justified based off of what Scientology has done to other people. All right. Okay. That is, I, I didn't expect the fame and just for the, the laws part of it. You know, I thought it was all very, you know, for lack of a better way to describe it, efficient. It was, we, we want money and rather than the, the traditional robbing a bank, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to, you know, punch in a few lines of code, break stuff, steal people's money. I didn't realize that there's, there's an even entirely new element to it of i want to be famous i want to have my rep you know that reputation of being the ultimate hacker or even yeah i'm bored like that's you know all of them are pretty nasty but at the same time i I didn't i didn't expect that but uh yeah that's that's interesting so with all with the knowledge we've got so far on you know what a hacker is by definition and why they do it when people go on the internet every single day, because it is such a big part of our lives now, what catches people out the most? And what is an easy fix that they can do so that they're, they're safe today? Well, that's going to kind of depend on what they're accessing. Because like you said, the internet's a very vast thing and it includes a lot of different pieces of our lives now. Um, if we're talking about, say, social media, um, a lot of that can be used for social engineering or trying to fool you into doing something that you shouldn't be doing. The way I usually define that is a hacker is trying to fool a target into doing something against their best interests for the hacker's personal gain. And that could be financial, it could be informational, um, it could be any number of things. So for the case of social media, use your privacy controls, lock down your profile, make sure that it's not easily accessible, and also police what you put on social media you know you don't need to post about every single thing in your day you don't need to do things like post about vacations until after you get home because a robber might be looking for people that are on vacation to break into and Mm -hmm. it's a lot easier when you're in cancun versus when you're going to the store yeah (laughs) yeah Um, if we're talking about something a little more secure say uh health records uh uh what financial data things like that that are a little more more uh, sensitive use strong passwords you know don't use just a simple little eight character password use the use as long as you can uh don't use common words or phrases or even something that's you know common to you for example birth dates are a big no-no because anyone who's got access to your social media knows your birth date oh crap yeah that's true and they also know the name of your dog the name (laughs) of your sister your mother's maiden name and so on and so on. So that's where you kind of have to be, be careful with what you post too. Choose security questions that are hard hard to answer. Uh, don't do things that are easily found on social media, like what's your dog's name? Yeah. Um, and going back to the passwords, uh, use secure passwords. Um, ha- uh, hackers have ways to break into systems called brute force attacks, where they just try hundreds and hundreds of passwords at a time. And they'll do very common ones first, like password one, which is the most common password out there, which is nerve wracking for me. (laughs) 
and you know the person's going to hear this is going oh wait that's my password i'll change it to password two well that's not <laughs> good what you should do is take a phrase so for example let's say mary had a little lamb take the first letter of each one of those words capitalize lowercase whatever you want to do replace with a number or a special character for example example instead of using l for love you can use the uh greater than and a three to make a little heart oh yeah um, add an exclamation point or a question at the end of it or something like that, or uh, just add something else to it to randomize it. You'll remember what, what your phrase is. And obviously don't pick one that's common, like Mary had a little lamb or something you find <laughs> in, find in the, uh, literature, like say, you know, to be or not to be, or, you know, it's part of the Gettysburg Address or something like that. Use something that's going to be meaningful to you that's not easily guessed. Yeah. And that'll give you a pretty good secure password. And of course, yeah. the longer, the better. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And what advice and what actionable steps could you also take when it comes to email? Because uh, I know certainly you know, it, it's only a matter of time before like you can create a brand new email. And before you know it, you know, you'll use that to sign up to certain things. Your information will be sold and it'll probably be on a data dump somewhere or, you know, it'll be inundated with spam and phishing is that the correct term yep yeah so you know how, what actionable steps can you take in regard to email that a lot of people don't know about it's just it's, it's an easy thing to do but it'll keep you safe okay well let's start with phishing because that one's kind of the big fish pardon the pun um you will want to be very cautious about any email that you come across because phishing emails look very legitimate Mm -hmm. um, at my organization, I actually test our staff members on, on a monthly basis for phishing tests, and I am pretty, pretty bad about it. I've had my name cursed a few times. <laughs> the stuff I've used has been very legit looking, very, um, very hard to detect unless you know the kind of the key things to look for. So you're going to look, want to look for things like what's the content of the message? Is it alarming but lack detail? So for example, you get an email saying, hey, your password just expired. Click this link to fix it. Well, what account is it talking about? That detail is usually left out. Um, the hackers will often try to short circuit your brain going, oh, I need to panic and deal with this right now as opposed to taking a second and thinking about it. Yeah. So they'll do other things like, you know, click here or you're going to lose your paycheck or your tax return or... You know, click here or you're going to lose access to something else important. Uh, commonly with uh, work emails or phishing emails targeting organizations, it's going to be, you know, click here, you're going to lose access or click here to sign a new policy or you're going to get fired, you know, that kind of thing. They always imply some kind of uh, travi or, uh, travi uh, travesty or really bad action is going to happen if you don't click on that link too. Mm-hmm. So be cautious on that. Look at the email sender. Hackers will often hack into other people's accounts to send out their phishing emails as opposed to starting their own. So if you get a email saying it's from Microsoft, but the email address is you know Bob at Acme Autos, obviously that's not something Microsoft would use. And you should also look closely at the email address because they'll also do things like lookalike domains. If you get an email from Microsoft, it's always going to be Microsoft.com, or maybe Office.com or Outlook.com. It's not going to be Bob at Acme Autos, or it's not going to be Microsoft with an R and an N as opposed to an M, or a zero mm. instead of an O, or Microsoft spelled with uh, two Fs. Things that kind of make it look like it should be legit, but it's just a little off. Nice to be on the lookout for that. Um, if you check the links in the message, this will also give you a good little indicator as to what's going on. If you hover your mouse over any link, it'll pop up and tell you exactly where it's going to go as opposed to what it says in the link. So, for example, you get an email saying it's from Yahoo, but the link is pointing it to Gmail. Obviously, there's just something quite right there. Um, also, look for kind of randomization in, in there. Look for you know, content that just doesn't make sense. You know, if it's supposed to be an email talking about a cooking show and it's taking you to a television station, that would make a little more sense than it's taking you to a uh, water park. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. Very well said. So uh, you did touch on it briefly um, earlier in the episode, but continuing with the theme of actionable steps you can take mm -hmm. to be safe. What about social media? Now I, I know a lot of people just know social media and that's probably the best way to go, but you already have social media What's, what actionable steps can you take to make sure you're as, as safe as reasonably possible? 
Okay. Well, start with locking down your account. Um, every social media platform has some kind of set of security tools that you can do. Um, you want to do things like not sharing it with the public, share, say, share with only friends and family or just friends. Be cautious who you invite into your circle. Um, you will have hackers that will try to use uh, catfishing accounts where they where they will download pictures and make it look like your say your uncle bob's account and they'll respond with messages saying hey i got locked out of my account so i started a new one be cautious of stuff like that always reach out to the person you know via a different means say by phone uh to verify that hey did you actually get locked out of your account yeah just to make sure that's safe be very cautious about what you put in social media uh there's a lot of re different reasons for doing that be it from hackers using it to get security questions to potential employers looking for key indicators that you might not be a uh, a responsible employee. For example, I knew one individual who used to search through social media pictures for red solo cups, the little you know, like camping cups. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, because if the person's underage and there's a lot of those photos, their chances are they're probably potential alcoholics or they party too much and they wouldn't be responsible. So uh, employers will look at social media whenever they can. So be cautious what you post there. Um, remember that if it's on the internet, it's there for life. So be very cautious on what you do end up putting on the internet. Uh, sensitive details about your life, you know, medical information, anything that you put up there could be potentially used or abused. Yeah. Um, so, so you did say something there, and I've heard I've heard this phrase a hundred times, but I've never stopped to actually think about it. And I just want to get your opinion on it. When it's on the internet, it's on for life. So, like, what? How is that? Because if I, for example, let's say I delete a picture or an old email account, or you know, pick, take your pick of whatever I put on the internet, or anybody puts it on the internet why is it on the internet forever is it locked away in a deep dark server somewhere is it somebody could download it like what 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 can you define what you mean once it's on the internet it's on there forever okay well with the way that the internet's laid out it's not just simple kind of a to b communications it's going to route through different networks to get to different places and any one of those hops in the network could potentially store the data you also have things like cache servers where, say, if you upload a, a picture to Facebook, it's not just on one server in Facebook. It's on multiple servers in Facebook. And even if you delete it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's been deleted from backups or shadow copies where they're just holding it in case you decide to you know, republish the image if you want to. Uh, you also have people that will scrape the Internet for images and text. Um, there was actually a lawsuit in the U.S. a few years ago regarding scraping a LinkedIn uh, LinkedIn didn't like it and was trying to claim copyright for it. And the 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 organization that was doing the scraping actually won because it was considered public information. Yeah. So they would grab that and store it. Um, you'll have uh, organizations like Imager, Google, Facebook that'll take those photos and store them and then use them for other purposes. Facebook uh, notoriously has been using it for facial recognition, which is why when you post a photo of one of your friends, it'll pop up and say, you know, is this so-and-so? Yeah. It's all photo recognition from there. Yeah. And you never know who else might have sold, saved a copy along the way and have it on their local hard drive that they could post up later. Yeah. So maybe perhaps take a, a pause before you click submit on anything on the internet, especially social yeah. media. Yeah. Definitely. See, that's so I, I'm perhaps going off on a slight tangent here. So when it's on the internet it's on there forever and if you know unless you have some big lawyers or something like that you know even if you could you know argue with a company and say facebook i'm not happy with you you know using my photos and facial recognition and having that sort of you know i feel a lot of my like privacy has been infringed upon you know arguably yes I, I, from what i'm getting here you could you know to make a lawsuit and all that kind of thing but it doesn't matter because like you said between each hop it's it's potentially been stored on multiple servers and on somebody somewhere for whatever reason could have saved it to a local computer yeah so and then you also have the issue of international law too where i'm sure if it's an u.s organization i could potentially sue to get that information taken down but what happens if it's in you know some other country 
you know, uh, we might have some some legal uh, ways to go about it for say, for example, Britain or or Scotland or Ireland, where we actually have treaties that allow us to go back and forth like that. But what if it's say Cambodia or Nigeria, uh, where yeah. that we don't have that you know reciprocity in law? Yeah. So the easiest thing to do is probably just to not post it. Like in fact, probably the best case scenario is not to have social media, but at the same time, social media is here to stay. And if you're going to have it, it's probably just the best to take all the advice you've just said. And if you are going to post anything, a little bit of common sense, but also, you know, a little bit of a pause. Does this need to be posted? Because once I post this, this is on the internet forever. Yep. Yeah, that's a quite sobering, but that's worth having a chat and, you know, being brutally honest, especially, you know, with myself and, you know, the audience as well. Um, it's better to, to know that rather than have our heads in the sand about it. Definitely. And you never know what a hacker is going to use that information for or not even just hackers, just organizations that want to use that data, too. Yeah, that that bring, that comes on perfectly to my next question, actually. And that is what makes you a less attractive target to a hacker that's going to depend on what the hackers after and you never know what the hackers actually after mm -hmm. um, i can just give you an example of this um, a honeypot is a device that sits on the internet that looks for people to break into it records everything that they do so they can learn about the hackers tools the techniques that they use stuff like that researchers use this all the time I was at a conference a couple of years ago where a researcher came in and gave a, a talk on what their experience was uh, putting up a, a honeypot. And it was just a, it was a Windows machine. It had remote desktop enabled on it, which is a very big no-no in security. And within about five, 10 minutes, someone broke in. And this, this uh, researcher put on all sorts of fake data, everything from medical records to trade secrets to financial records, all of the fake data, but it looked real. What do you think the hacker actually did once you broke into the system um well to me I, I i for me i'd just be copy and paste and take the whole lot and decide whether it's valuable later or is that i yeah. don't know no nope, he didn't even look at it didn't touch it at all okay. what he did or i should say he or she I, we don't know what the gender of this person was was open up dating websites wow and, really? they, and what they were doing was they were catfishing people out of money you know, using what we call lonely heart scams or yeah. just catfishing in general and saying, hey, you know, I'll come visit you, but if you send me X amount of money, that'll help me afford a plane ticket and it just never happens. And they just keep yeah. fleecing you for more and more money. Well, dating websites will block IP addresses uh, left and right for people that are doing this. So the hacker was looking for what they consider clean IP addresses or IP addresses that the, the dating websites hadn't blocked yet. And that's the only thing that they did while they were on that system. That's insane. I mean, yeah. like all that, what, what, you know, I'm uneducated in it, but all that, what you would argue would be valuable information and all they wanted was a clean IP address. That's, yep. that's insane. I mean, this is a whole new world. Like, you know, I, I'll be honest, my only experience with anything, cybersecurity, information security, it is what I see in the movies, you know, and bar and the occasional, like if I happen to stumble upon something on YouTube, which says, you know, catchy title, don't do this to get hacked or something. I think I may have watched one years ago, but I've never actually dedicated any real time to say, you know, how secure am I online? How secure is my data? Now, to be fair, I do. And this is a question actually I, I wanted to get your opinion on and, but not to get into specifics because I don't know what the legalities of it are. Uh, is that like, I'm very keen on antivirus. I know a lot of people aren't, uh, they just either just aren't bothered to, to pay the money for it. But for me, I, I like my antivirus. Um, but in your opinion, regardless of brand, and I don't want to name any because I'm not sure uh, what the legalities of that are if you are allowed to do it, but like what what is a, what's a sets a good standard in your mind that says that's a good antivirus brand in that like what what do they sell or what what are they advertising that you go okay that that makes that's good because then people can go okay now that i'm informed in this decision regardless of brand whoever if as long as they're selling this particular um this particular protection or this particular way to protect your information then i can i'm happy to pay that price or, or whatever okay I think some of that's going to depend also on what you're trying to protect. 
Uh, right. Security isn't a, a catch all, do all these things to fix the things kind of situation. It's a, what do we need to do that's reasonable to protect what's on the system? Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example of that. So for example, let's say uh, financial institution, their core system that houses all the financial data, that's a very high target. That's something you want to spend a lot of money on protecting. Now, if you've got a server that hosts the, uh, you know, billboard for the cafeteria, you really don't care too much about that. You'll put in basic protection to make sure that system can't be abused, but you don't want to pay the extra money to protect the data because who cares what the menu is going to be for Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to antivirus, use what's reasonable for you. You don't need to spend an arm and a leg on it, but use a, a well-known brand. Don't just you know, pick some random one off the internet. And there are some pretty decent free ones out there too. Mm-hmm. Uh, AVG and Avast both come to mind as being free alternatives that give you the same kind of protection that a more or a larger name brand would, uh, but they are free. They will bombard you with ads, but that's the the cost for it, so to speak. Uh, use use a major antivirus if you can. I'd recommend an antivirus that also protects against anti malware. Um, most of them do these days, and if you want to spend the money on it, look for one that's also behavior based as opposed to signature based. So signature-based uh, virus detection is basically, okay, here's a list of things that I know are viruses. I'm going to look for these things every time I see a file or a program opens up or mm -hmm. whatever activity happens that triggers it. Behavior-based will examine what you do on a regular basis and then act based on that. So for example, uh, let's say on an average day, you encrypt maybe two or three files tops. Well, what happens if you start encrypting thousand of files a minute? Well, that's a ransomware attack. A behavior-based antivirus would stop that activity. Wow. I, I did not even know that existed. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I just press scan on my computer and off it goes. And, you know, it says it's doing all this weird and wonderful thing. But then I never knew to look for them to potential different ways to protect. So that's that's quite interesting. I'll actually look into my own antivirus and see if it does that. Yeah, most of the, of the consumer level ones don't. But that doesn't mean that signature-based virus detection is bad. In fact, the the um, advanced malware protections will also do signature-based attacks because, you know, sometimes a signature-based doesn't have a weird behavior associated with it. Um, the behavior-based stuff is more for what we consider zero days or attacks that are in the wild that no one knows about, that no one else has seen. Mm. Um, they're usually bigger targets for organizations or, or companies, say, you know, defense contractors, banks, medical right. firms so like that usually get targeted with that or nation states too fair enough then okay um that's a lot to think about at least for me personally and uh my next question then would be what resources would you recommend for the average person that you know they can either read up on and educate themselves or even you know, I don't know if it's like software, like you, you've already recommended there's free antivirus. And while it perhaps, and while it does do so, uh, just as good as perhaps some of the big paid brands, you know, it's probably not as good as others, but it's better than nothing. You know, what mm -hmm. resources are available that uh, you can use to better protect yourself? Well, antivirus is, is pretty much a must at this point because um, you never know what you potentially might catch. Other resources. Uh, education is always a good one. There is a lot of good free education out there that you can just use to educate yourself. And it, it can be a little scary depending on where you go, but a, a good place to start would be say Reddit. There are a ton of different subreddits that actually uh, house either simple information about cybersecurity or training information. YouTube is another great resource if you want to mm -hmm. learn about security in general. Um, all of the major um, conventions or, um, or hack, hack, uh, hacking cons uh, post their videos online for anyone to view. Uh, so you have things like Black Hat, Shmoo, DEF CON, which is probably the more famous of the lot, mm -hmm. uh, Derby Con, uh, B-Sides, all of these things post their videos online for free that you can then go and learn more about cybersecurity. Be cautious of social engineering because most, most cyber attacks do start with a, cyber, or with a uh, personal element. So learn the, the cues for social engineering or the more common term that I've heard is con men. Um, same basic thing. They're trying to fool you into doing something that's against your best interests. 
So being strong in, in social engineering game would probably be a good start just to get an idea of, and feel for what they're going to do and what they're going to try to do to trick you into doing what they want. Mm -hmm. um, there's also tons of books that you could read. There's, you name a, a medium, there's probably something out there, tons of podcasts and so on. Happy days. And just my final question would be, uh, you've given me and the audience a lot to think about and a lot of really useful information. But do you have any final advice or, you know, if you could do it all again, like your first time going on the internet, knowing what you know now, would you have done anything different? Oh, very much so. I would have been a little more cautious on the information I posted. Um, I actually had a, a live journal on the internet for quite a while. That was just an old journaling site before blogs became blogs. Um, and that information ended up getting housed in Russia. So be careful where your data lives. Um, you never know what, what a nation state actor is going to do with that data. Be cautious what you post on social media just in general. So you don't want to share too much information or anything that could potentially be embarrassing for you later on in life. And overall, just you know, be cautious. Don't take anything at face value on the internet. You don't know if the information is fake news or it could be malicious. You don't know if that person on the other end of the computer is there to actually help you or hurt you. Mm -hmm. Stick with reputable uh, companies wherever you can. Uh, be cautious if it's a small organization or entity because you never know what they might end up doing. Anything from stealing a credit card to stealing information and selling it. Uh, definitely get good antivirus, get good protections in place. Uh, run regular scans to make sure everything is safe and secure. And if it does detect anything, be cautious about it. And use good strong passwords. That's probably the biggest one because accounts are a lot harder to break into if your password is you know safe and secure versus you know something simple that anyone can guess. And I guess one thing I would like to add on that is um, if you want to spend the extra little, little bit of cash on it, and there are free options for this too, use a password vault. Yes. Password, password vaults are a, are software that will store passwords for you and, and house it under a one secure password that you have to remember. They'll also generate very, very secure passwords. They're just random characters, you know, any length that you want. Keep the password for the vault safe. Don't share it with anybody. Make sure it's nice and secure, nice and long, and that'll take care of your passwords for you real easy. Yeah, that's, that's amazing advice. Thank you so much for that. Um, so that's all my questions for today and i got a lot of value out of this and i know that the audience will as well so charles i just to say massive thank you for coming on again today and with any luck we'll have you back on the podcast again sometime soon so thank you very much no problem anytime it was a pleasure